In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Him. Beloved, I congratulate you on the beginning of the Holy Season, Nativity, the Holy Advent. This is a great season because we're preparing for a great feast and massive occasion. A feast that is of epic proportions. It is in this feast that all the words of all the prophets are fulfilled. All the prophets who have been prophesying from the time of Abel until, Joseph, until John the Baptist find their fulfillment now in this great coming Christ. Today, all the expectation of all the generations of the people will be realized in this coming feast. Last week we spoke about the angels and how great they are. And yet, with the incarnation of Christ, God will make himself lower than the angels, but will make mankind greater than the angels. Our Master has come to share in our poverty that we might be found worthy to share in his glory. And for this, we should rejoice. This is such a monumentous thing that the Church gives us 40 days to prepare for this feast. 40 days of preparation. 40 days of fasting. I read St. Paisios a long time ago when I was a layperson. He was talking about Pascha, and he was talking about how to celebrate it. And he said, about the lay people of Greece at the time, he said, for these people, Pascha is lamb. But for us monastics, we celebrate Pascha in our hearts with deep preparation. It's a spiritual ascent. Unfortunately, in Greece, there are many pious lay people, but there are many more people who think Pascha is rifles being shot in the sky, rockets being sent into heaven, and a lamb on a spit. But it's much more than this. And recently, I was, I was vouchsafed to watch this wonderful talk given by Elder Zacharias, the spiritual son of St. Sophronia, the spiritual grandchild of St. Silouan, and he was talking to St. Tikhon's monastery, and this talk was back in 2017. And he spoke about some very important things that tie into what St. Paisius meant. He spoke about the power of contrition and of thanksgiving. And he was speaking to priests, or he was speaking to seminarians, men who will become priests. And he was saying to them, he said, you need to teach the people to come always with contrition and to come always with thanksgiving when they come to the liturgy. This woman asked him, how do you prepare this matus? Matushka, this presbytery, said, how do we prepare? And he said, you should never neglect your weekly prayers, your daily prayers. And the work of this daily prayer is to become contrite before God or to become thankful. And so when you come to the church, your entire being is narrowed into one thought either contrition before God, saying, I'm a sinner, Lord, forgive me, or, Lord, glory to you, who has done everything for us. And these two places to be are the best places, because when a man is contrite, he is humble, and when he is thankful, he is very humble, and then God will give him everything. And if that is true, and I know that it is true from my own life and experience, how much more so should we spend 40 days preparing for this great feast? The church gives us 40 days to let go of things, so we may focus on what is more needful. So we may fast from food, and this is very important, but also to fast from thoughts, to fast from worldly attachments, to fast from everything that would disturb our contrition. You see, nothing disturbs contrition or thanksgiving so much as criticism, judging others, worldly thoughts, worldly attachments, all kinds of worldly things we fill ourselves with, entertainments, jokes, all these things. We have to be careful what we joke about. We have to be careful what we think about so we don't disturb this contrition and we lay a good foundation for it. I was reading also and remembered also the words of Abba Isaac, this massive, massive saint, a great saint. Abba Isaac was talking about how to begin virtue. He says, you lay virtue by leaving aside worldly affairs. He says, no one can draw nigh to God save the man who has separated himself from the world. But I call separation not the departure of the body, but the departure from the world's affairs. This is virtue, that in his mind a man should be unoccupied with the world. Oftentimes men, you can say, you can see men who listen to great and holy things, but they're unmoved. A man, a priest, can preach all kinds of things, and men remain unmoved. You can read to them from the scriptures, and their hearts remain hard. And Abba Isaac says, why? He says, a word concerning virtue, a holy word, has need of a heart unbusy with the earth and its converse. For when a man's mind, wearying itself with care about transitory things, the concerns of virtue do not awaken his thought to a longing and a quest to gain them. And so when men are burdened with all kinds of earthly things and they give their heart to them, it's hard for them to awaken to virtue. And Abba Isaac isn't speaking about leaving the world, physically, as I said, as I read. He's speaking about where a man's heart is. 
And so someone can say, Father, if you say these things, can anyone be saved in the world? Don't ask such a question. David was so holy. David was a king. People come and say, Father, I'm stressed. Okay, so you have stress, but do you have stress like David's stress? David ruled the kingdom of thousands, and he had to answer for their bodily needs. And David also waged war all the time. What is more stressful than war? David killed a lot of people with his own hands, many times. And yet he would lift these same hands to God and pray. And in the scriptures it says, David would never go to war without consulting God, without asking him for help. Going to him and saying, Lord, should I go up? Should I go to war? And the Lord would say, yes, I'll be with you. I'll help you. And so David had politics, David had intrigues, David had rebellious sons, David had scandals, David had all kinds of problems. And you can see this in the Psalms, where David's crying, saying, Lord, I am surrounded by enemies. Evil men speak against me all day long. And yet, O Lord, I water my bed with tears, and I look to thee for help. And that's where David lived. David was a man firmly in the world, but his heart was in heaven, as the Psalms show us. One time, St. Anthony the Great was in the desert, you know, and he was thinking to himself, has anyone attained virtue like unto me? And the Lord said, yes, someone is far greater than you. And Anthony said, who? And he says, a cobbler in Alexandria. And Anthony thought, well, what? So he said, I will go now. He got his staff, he put his cloak on, he went to see this cobbler who was living in the middle of busy Alexandria. And Anthony sat down in his shop and looked at him. The cobbler wouldn't even look up from his shoe. He kept fixing it and working on it. And Anthony said, man, what manner of life do you have? And he said, what can I tell you, monk? He said, I get up in the morning, I say my prayers, and I say to myself, everyone in the city will be saved except me. And then I work and I pray and I work and I pray. And in the evening, I say my prayers again, and I say, Lord, you will save everyone in this city, but I alone will be damned because I'm a sinner. And then I go to bed. And Anthony said, beloved, he said, I've toiled in the desert for many, 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 many years, but I have not found your humility yet. And Anthony gave thanks to God and left. Glorifying him. Beloved, the three holy hierarchs, John, Christus, and Basil, the great Gregory, the theologian, they spent their life in the world. They were in the desert for a short time, but they spent most of their life in the world. Most of their great works were in the world. Christus spent a few years in the monastery, a couple years in seclusion, and he spent the rest of his life in the hustle and bustle of the city. In all the politics and all the intrigues and all the problems and all the issues that went on in the big city. And he lived in one of the biggest cities, Antioch in the Constantinople. But his mind was in heaven the whole time. If he had been weighed down with earthly cares, he would have fallen from his high place. But he thought endlessly of God. So did St. Basil the Great, so did Gregory the Theologian. Beloved, John of Brunstad, one of the greatest saints of the 20th century, never went to the monastery. He might have visited them a few times, but he spent his whole life in the world. And the city he lived in was an awful, awful place. But people complain about Eugene, but I'll be honest with you, like, you see Kronstadt, it was a horrible place, a naval city, and there was drunks all the time. In fact, St. John would walk to church and you see these men puking in the gutter, crawling around, all of them drunk, massively drunk. You would see women with their faces black as their husbands were beating them because they wanted money and the husbands had drunk it all. And women begging, hoping that someone would give them something because their husband had drunk everything. Children crying because they were hungry. This is what the city was like in an Orthodox country, and it was a disgrace. And so St. John is surrounded by all these things, prostitution, everything, all this nonsense. And yet he becomes saved. He not only doesn't, does he not fall, but he becomes holy. And he becomes so holy that thousands are saved all around him, in the middle of this disgusting city, this horrendous, awful place. In fact, now the word Kronstadt is tied to the saint's name. It's pretty amazing, but it was not a great place. St. Porphyrios, this massive 20th century saint, lived most of his life in Athens. He was, a, he was the chaplain of, a, of a, a church connected to the main hospital. That's where he spent his life. Well, but you can become holy in the world. You can be saved in the world. But you become saved in the world by letting your thoughts attune to heaven. You keep your mind in heaven. Every man has to do his work, whether he's a professor, whether he drives, whether he is a carpenter. It doesn't matter. Man keeps his heart in his work, but his mind is with God, and his heart is also with God. And he offers to God his work, and he labors. St. Paisios, one time, when he was very young monk, he was the guardian of the monasteries, who was watching the gate, and he saw this man in the bushes, because the night had come. And he was in charge of hospitality, and so he went out to this man sleeping in the bushes, and he said, Beloved, why are you sleeping in the bushes? We have a guest house for you. And this man was so humble, he said, Oh, Father, he said, I don't want you to trouble the monks and wake them up on my account, because... I'm just some sinner. Like, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm a sinner. And St. Paisios says, No, I insist. I'm the master of the guest house. It's my job. Come on. And, and pulled him into the guest house. <laughs> and 
And he said to me, and he said to the man, tell me your story, man. And the man was a porter, which means all he would do is unload ships all day long. He would unload ships all day long. And then he would go home. And this man was very simple, very simple, but he's very, very humble and very pious. And he had a father-in-law that he loved very much, and a mother-in-law too. And his father-in-law, unfortunately, would blaspheme all the time, all the time he would curse God and swear and do these terrible things. And his son-in-law, this porter, was grieved by this deeply because he went to church and he prayed and he loved God. And this man's faith was so great and he was so blessed. And one day his father-in-law, Lord forgive him, died in the state of blasphemy. He died in this awful state. And this tormented the young porter so much that he went to the morgue because he found out after work. He walked to the morgue and he went down weeping and crying. He saw his father-in-law there. And he put his hand and he grabbed his father's hand and said, Come on home, father. We should return. And his father stood up and walked with him. And they returned together. And this man's faith was so great, he raised this man from the dead. And St. Paisios, who is this monk, was like, Oh my goodness, this is incredible. This is amazing. And he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. There was another porter, another story. Of this man named Simeon, he was a porter too. And every day he would walk from his home to the dock to do his job, and he would pass this teeny little church, and he would always do a prostration or a bow, and he would say, Good morning, my Christ, help me to earn my bread. And he would go and he'd work. And every night he would come home and he would do the same thing. He would say, Thank you, my Christ, for helping me to earn my bread. Good night. And so as Simeon was nearing his death, he was in this old folks' home, and these people said, Call a priest, we think he's deluded. We think that Simeon is deluded, because he's speaking to Christ. And this priest came to him and he, and he visited him. And he said, what does Christ say to you, Simeon? And Simeon says, every morning he comes to me and he says, good morning, Simeon, have patience. And every evening he comes to me and he says, good evening, Simeon, have patience. I will come and take you soon. See, beloved, the world is not an impediment to salvation, but our mind is an impediment to our salvation. Have pure thoughts. Think about pure things. Our thoughts determine our lives, as Elder Thaddeus says. Have your mind in heaven. We have no excuse. If David the king can be saved, not only be saved, barely, but become a massive saint, we should labor in the world to become good. Well, but during this fast, we should pray more. We should fast. But we should also meditate. Sometimes we pray too much. We pray a lot. We move from prayer to prayer to prayer. We don't think about what we're praying about. We don't think about the mysteries of God. Sometimes we need to sit with the scriptures. We need to read them. And then we need to think about them and say, what does it mean that God became a man? What does that even mean? What does this mean? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for the world? What does it mean for salvation? What does this mean? And we should sit and we should think about it. And we should also pray. We should take our Bible and our prayer up and go sit somewhere quiet and read a little bit and pray a little bit and think a little bit and say, Lord, help me to understand this mystery. Help me to be grateful for what you have done. Help me to be filled with contrition. Help me to be filled with repentance that I am so unworthy that you would come and save me, but I am delighted that you would do so. Love it. Don't waste your potential in, in too many entertainments. Don't waste your thoughts in vain things. Do your work, but also think about God. Amen.